So we have the digestive system. We're going to go through just the I'll go through just the list of like the study guide list for you guys. And then we can hit other images if we want to see things more clearly. So for this part, first part, <clears throat> for this first part, you should know the parts of the peritoneum. So what is the two, what are the two parts of the peritoneum? Parietal and visceral. Parietal is going to be the bubble around the intestines. Visceral is going to actually be touching the surface of the peritoneum. What are the four main layers of the GI tract? The innermost layer touching food is going to be mucosa. And then beyond that, it's going to be the submucosa. Then beyond that, muscularis externa. And then beyond that, the outermost layer with connective tissue is the serosa. That's right. So the functions, really, the mucosa layer is going to be what we interface with the food. So different parts is going to have a different role. So you want to think of like in the esophagus, it's more about protection. So the connect, so the sorry, the epithelial tissue in that region is going to be more about abrasion. So it's going to be stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Where in the stomach, we're more about secreting the you know the components. It's going to make pepsin, digest proteins. We have to have a combination of not only making these agents, but then protecting ourselves from our own digestion. That would be the goblet cells. So there's going to be different cell types there for that purpose. Then the duodenum, we have to have a mixture. We want to protect ourselves from acidic bile coming in, but we also then want to provide the opportunity for absorptions. We have villi, we've got the simple columnar cells, but we also have those bicarbonate cells to create, um, to buffer the acidity. And then, you know, so throughout the whole GI tract, you're going to have some variations. And then you've got the submucosa that's going to be bringing in vessels or where a lot of the vessels are housed, the connective tissue, whereas the muscularis externa is going to be doing its contractions to move food along. The autonomic nervous system role in GI function, I really don't have any detail in terms of the control outside of, I want you to realize that the GI function is primarily going to be parasympathetic. It's not evenly balanced. This is one of those areas where the sympathetic nervous system really doesn't do much outside of just shut it down when you're scared or running. Like pretty much divert flow elsewhere, digestion can go on hold. But you know, over like almost 90%, 70-90% of the action of the digestion and moving food along is really a parasympathetic driven thing. So I just wanted to kind of point that out. Things aren't always going to be even. Um, you should know about the structure of teeth. So we talked about the neck, the crown, the roots. You should know the anatomy of a tooth as far as the enamel, the dentin, the pulp cavity, the root canals. You should know the edges have cementum and the periodontal ligaments and the gums are going to be the gingiva. This is what's going to sit down in your teeth. The gingiva is going to go around and protect it. You should know the types of teeth and the number of each, and you should know the total number of teeth. Then the location of the salivary glands, you should know the parotids are near the masseter muscle on the ramus of the mandible. You get submandibular salivary glands, which are under the mandible, and the sublingual, which is under the tongue. You should know what they secrete. The two main secretions that I want you to be aware of, aside from water, are going to be salivary amylase that digests carbohydrates, initiates the carbohydrate digestion, and then we have the bicarbonate, which will neutralize any acidic food coming into your mouth. The histology of the salivary glands are such they look like they have like dark and um, light acini, so like the little glandular components. The submandibular gland is the one that has the most evenly balanced number of the dark and light. So if you were to see them on a practical exam, I would utilize the submandibular one. One concern that you should have is the submandibular often looks like the pancreas, so you want to make sure you can discern the difference between the two. Um, the components of saliva really is mostly water, mucus, that salivary amylase and the bicarbonate. 
any questions on this or any areas that we want to kind of go into a little more detail? Okay. I'm jump forward to the next section. So part two for the esophagus and stomach, you want to look at or be familiar with the esophagus structures and histology. So that's um, structures really being maybe the sphincter muscles. Um, they're not as obvious structure. The histology is going to be the one that I'd, I'd really focus a little bit more on here where we had, for instance, that last slide and that little quickie quiz we did longer than a quickie quiz, I guess. But um, you have the mucosa layers, you're gonna have stratified squamous epithelial tissue, you're gonna have the submucosa, you're gonna have the um, circular and longitudinal muscle that make up the muscularis externa. So you'll just, if you see a histology slide of the esophagus, you can tell that it is that generally because you almost always see it curve like a tube. A lot of the other areas we're looking a little bit deeper and more high powered. So the esophagus, generally we don't look at it so high powered, but the inner mucosa part looks unique to the other areas because it is that stratified squamous. The um, fresh cells at that bottom layer is gonna be dark purple and it usually fades or dark pink. But so that kind of gives it a, a unique look too. The stomach structures and histology, there's a lot more anatomy going on with the stomach. So we had the cardia region, we had the fundus, you had the body, pyloric region, you had the pyloric sphincter, you've got rugae inside. So there's a lot more features of the stomach. We know, you should know the lesser omentum hangs up, goes upward from the lesser curvature of the stomach and the greater omentum hangs below. So the way it lies in the GI tract, once you open um, the parietal peristeum, you'll see the greater omentum laying down over the intestines. You'll see the surface of the stomach and then you'll see the lesser omentum, but everything else is pretty much covered up. Um, the histology of the stomach, we know that those, the mucosa layer is going to have those deep gastric pits. So at the top of the pits, the closest into the lumen is going to be our goblet cells that make mucus. Down in the middle third of the pits, we're going to have the parietal cells that secrete hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. And then at the bottom is going to be the chief cells that secrete pepsinogen. You should know that the parietal cells that secrete the intrinsic factor and hydrochloric acid what the role of each one of those things are. Hydrochloric acid is used to convert pepsinogen into pepsin and then further drop the pH in the stomach so that it can activate the pepsin to digest proteins. The intrinsic factor binds to vitamin B12 so that that combination can be absorbed in the ileum. Um, the stomach is the only place that has three layers in their muscularis mucosa sorry, in their muscularis externa. So the three layer, the, the extra layer is called the what layer? Destiny, the oblique layer, yes. So it's called the oblique layer. It's the only one that add, has that extra layer and it's gonna be just adjacent to the submucosa. Um, chemical digestion of proteins, you should know that. We just sort of mentioned that when I was talking about the stomach mucosa. That's where you have chief cells secreting pepsinogen. You have parietal cells secreting hydrochloric acid. They combine to form pepsin. Additional hydrochloric acid drops the pH so that now that pepsin becomes active and it starts to break those peptide bonds. Who can tell me what the role of mucus in the stomach is? Protects our cells from the, our own activated pepsin from getting into the wall of our stomach. So if you don't have enough mucus in your stomach, you're going to have, have an ulcer because you're going to digest yourself. Small intestine. The three regions of the small intestine are the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. The duodenum secretes bicarbonate. The duodenum receives bile from the gallbladder. The duodenum receives pancreatic juices, which are just pancreatic enzymes that can digest fats, which would be pancreatic lipase. The duodenum receives 
trypsin from the pancreas, which digests proteins at a neutral pH, and the duodenum receives pancreatic amylase, which digests carbohydrates from the pancreas. The duodenum has the Brunner's glands in the submucosa that secrete the bicarbonate, which buffers the acidic chyme from the stomach. So that is a very unique and distinct histological feature. Then there is the jejunum. Major job is for absorption. So we wanna have long slender villi, many villi, very long to increase surface area. The ileum has shorter villi. The ileum is where we absorb vitamin B12 as long as intrinsic factor is bound to it. The ileum has the unique histological feature of the Peyer's patches. The end of the ileum is where we have the ileocecal valve. Once that ileocecal valve is open, the food from the small intestine will go into the cecum, which is the start of the large intestine. The large intestine has a fair amount of anatomy with it. So you should know the cecum, the appendix hangs off of the cecum. We have the ascending colon going up. We have the hepatic flexure on the right side. We go to the transverse colon, and then we go to the splenic flexure on the left side. Then there is the descending colon, sigmoid colon, and the rectum. The other unique feature of the large intestine is the stripe that you can see on the surface known as tenia coli. And then the stripe, the contraction of that creates these pouches known as haustra. Inside the large intestine on the histology, you just really see from top to bottom of the mucosa, lots of goblet cells, just a lot of white circles. So that's really the primary unique feature that you're gonna be looking for to identify a colon slide or a large intestine slide. So the accessory glands and digestion, they're listed differently just because it's not really part of the tube that food has gone in. So now we're sort of, these are things that are contributing to the tube, but the food isn't going in these things. So the pancreas we've mentioned already is off the side adjacent to the duodenum is going to send secretions that will cover digestion of fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. And there's lots of them but I'm just gonna pick one for each one of those things. So if I were to say, you know, the pancreas releases what to digest fat, it would be pancreatic lipase. And one of the many things that it uses to digest proteins, but we'll just name one, will be trypsin. Trypsin is used, is made by the pancreas, released in the duodenum, and it breaks down peptide bonds at a neutral pH. Whereas the stomach made pepsin, which digested proteins at a very low pH. So the pancreas then also makes pancreatic amylase, which digests carbohydrates. The histology of the pancreas is that it looks like more of one continuous, um, uh, the cells in it to me looks like one continuous carpet with just some lighter regions that are the islet of Langer hands and the darker regions are gonna be the acini. It's less divided up, I think, visually, compared to the submandibular salivary gland, because that's the one that people confuse it with. As far as the liver, the function of the liver is detoxification. We make components of our, we create proteins from our liver, we create fat from our liver, we can create carbs from our liver, we create plasma proteins that's going to circulate around, clotting proteins. So the liver creates a lot of things. It detoxifies and removes waste as well. It forms bile. Bile has a lot of the waste, like old cholesterol, things that we want to just dump out and excrete and remove from our body. But we also utilize bile to emulsify fat. That means mechanically separate fat into smaller droplets. In the liver, we bring in blood to the liver. There are two vessels that bring blood to the liver. One is the hepatic artery. The other is the hepatic portal vein. That's the blood that would have waste that the liver would then remove. So the clean blood arrives in the middle of these lobules into the central vein. The central veins have the clean blood that then exit 
the liver via the hepatic vein. The waste leaves the liver via bile ducts. The bile then get, leaves the liver as a whole via the common hepatic duct and then goes into the cystic duct to be stored into the gallbladder. And then if it's gonna leave and go to the small intestine, it goes down the common bile duct. The digestion and absorption process of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. So if we're gonna start with carbohydrates, it starts with your mouth. If we're gonna chew it, that's mechanically digest. We add in some salivary amylase and we start the carbohydrate digestion. That gets bumped down into our stomach there's no more carbohydrate digestion going on outside of just mechanically mushing it around a little bit more. Then we finally get it into the duodenum where we add pancreatic amylase, which is going to digest carbohydrates. Proteins, chew in the mouth. Then we drop it down. So it's only mechanical digestion in the mouth. The first chemical digestion from proteins happen in the stomach from pepsin with the low pH. And then we finish the digestion of proteins in the duodenum. Then fat, we just, don't, we just don't even think about any of the other parts until it gets the duodenum. We break it down, mechanically digest it, and emulsify it by bile in the duodenum, and then we digest it by pancreatic lipase in the duodenum. The hormones of digestion, you have gastrin, which when protein arrives in the stomach, it tells the stomach to start churning, releasing the pepsinogen and all of that. The other two, secretin and cholecystokinin, are in the duodenum. They both tell the stomach to slow down. One does it because of acidity, tells bicarbonate to be released. The other, cholecystokinin, tells the stomach to slow down while it's also telling the gallbladder to release bile. 